Okay, so we're looking at how there are better days ahead. And the main idea I want you to get from this series is that God is working to give us a future. In the last lesson, we talked about the way that there's, there's a better future past your past. I, I remember as I was working on this lesson, I remember there was a woman that I had on my worship team. Um, we'll call her Margaret. And uh, she was a very talented person. She knew how she knew a lot about music, about the you know anything that I wanted to do musically. She was just totally right there with me. I didn't have to catch her up to speed. Um, she was very well talented. She'd studied for a long time in music. This was something that like she was just right with me in regards to music. And uh, she was very familiar with the church too. So I was able to talk about ideas, and she was able to contribute a lot of good ideas. But here's where the problem was her attitude. It stunk. And when I got there and I started uh, up the worship team, I talked with the, everybody in the worship team and I said, I, I only have one rule, okay? You guys can mess up. You guys can, can miss. I mean, there, there, there's just one rule that I have and that's absolutely no gossip. And she just wouldn't stop. She constantly had negative comments to say, nitpicking, gossiping, and it wasn't like helpful, constructive criticism, and it wasn't like a godly thing, like somebody was living in sin and she was, you know, addressing the sin. No, it wasn't like that at all. It was just, she had something negative to say about everything. She was a bitter person, and she was just, just nasty. And unfortunately, I ended up having to dismiss her, because the worship team wasn't about just about talent, it was about heart, and she lacked that heart. And it was something where it was a constant problem where I had to constantly deal with it. And I remember before she left, around the time that I had asked her to step down, she made this comment. She said, I've been like this for so long that I just don't think I can change. Completely at a point of just hopelessness about it. I just don't think I can change at this point. Now, that story just has something to do with something, okay? We are going to go back to it, and it's going to fit in with the rest of it. Just hold on. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Well, that sounds great. It sounds encouraging, but what does that mean? Well, to really understand what that means, you really have to look at the verses around it, which is called the context. You have to kind of read what is Galatians 6 saying to know what Galatians 6, 9 is saying, if that kind of makes sense. But before we get there, I want to look at a couple different words and kind of break them down and make them easier to understand because some of us think that we know these words and some of us don't know these words. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. Sowing, most people know that that is to plant. But more specifically, sowing is to plant seed by scattering. Seed by scattering. So when you're planting seeds, you're planting a lot of them and you don't know which ones are going to grow. You don't know which ones are going to take. And so you scatter them. And so it, obviously you can see the, uh, the image or the metaphor there and how it's used in m more ministry aspects of, well, you don't know which seeds that you plant in another person's life which are going to grow, so you're scattering to a bunch of different people. You're scattering to a bunch of different ministries, a bunch of different opportunities. So then you have another word that's used, reap. Now this is basically, if you know anything about farming, you already know this word, and it's probably what you thought it meant, to gather what was it, whatever was harvested, whatever was, I mean, what, not harvested, whatever was planted. So that's a pretty simple word. And that takes us to the final word that I want to look at, good. If you remember, and I don't, let me go back to Galatians 6, 9, it says, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. And that, that really asks the question, what is good? So good in this context is obviously talking about a valuable action, but what makes it valuable? How do you decide that this is a valuable thing, this is not a valuable thing? Well, so now that we've gotten that kind of out of the way, let's look at Galatians 1 through 5 and then 7 through 10. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. See, if you're really spiritual, you restore people. It's not about how much of the Bible you've memorized. It's not about um, if you know who wrote what, if you're the greatest singer in the world. It's not about any of that. If you're spiritual, you're restoring people with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. 
For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work. And then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. And so we can summarize all five of those verses like this. Weigh your attitude. How you treat others and how you view yourself. Weigh your attitude. You're not the world's greatest gift to mankind. The church isn't just so lucky to have you. Uh, and you need to be careful with how you're treating other people. Are you treating them like they are gods? Or are you treating them like you can just do whatever you want? So that takes us to verse 7 through 10. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Now, ignore the eight. That's just, it's the verse for, it's it just saying where verse eight begins. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. So now you see how verse uh, verse 9 fits in there. The one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. And that begs the question, what does that mean to sow to the Spirit? And we'll talk about that in just a second. Don't, don't get ahead of me here. But uh, now you can see, let us not get tired, therefore, of doing good, uh, you know, of, these, of the sowing that we're doing. So we're going to go back to that question, what makes it what makes it good, what makes it a valuable action, this whole let us not get tired of doing good, we'll, we'll get to that. But before we get there, um, let's just kind of continue on with this, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up, we're going we're gonna to have a harvest at the end of this. So I think that we could summarize verses 7 through 10 by saying this. So if verses 1 through 5 was weigh your attitude, 7 through 10 is basically sow what you want to reap. See, life is a series of trades. You spend this to get that. You spend your time to learn an instrument, or maybe you spend your time to watch TV. You give up your time at work, they give you money. So it's an exchange. Life is a series of trades. You can learn an instrument, or you can watch TV. You can read the Bible, or you can read a book. Or, you know, a, a, a different book. The Bible is a book, but a different book. Life is a series of trades. Everything in life is a series of trades. Sometimes people make trades, um, you can either choose your family or you can choose your work. And unfortunately, many times men especially choose uh, work over family. Of course, nowadays, uh, more and more common women are choosing um, work over having a family. Um, and that's a whole different issue, but uh, it pretty much produces the exact same result. Life is a series of trades, this or that. And you can't go back in time, you can't go back and pick something else. And once it's traded, it's gone. So I guess we could say life is choices and consequences. You choose this, you get that. So you sow what you want to reap. Imagine if you wanted to lose weight. Well, you'd need to sow diet and exercise, and then you would reap weight loss or being healthier, either or. Um, so we could ask the question, well, what would you have to sow to reap maturity? And the thing I want you to get about sowing and reaping is that we will all reap eventually sometimes we do work and we say uh i just don't see any result for all the hard work that i did well just because you haven't re reaped or reaped repped <laughs> reaped yet doesn't mean that you won't ever reap you will reap eventually and sometimes eventually is going to be in heaven and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing see we have to eventually lose the here focus. Eventually we have to get our eyes focused on eternity, not here. And in that way, death and pain can oftentimes be a blessing because it focuses our faith on the eternal instead of on the temporary. So now that we've asked that, well, answered that, we can go back and say, okay, well, what does this really mean to sow to the spiritual? What does that, what does that mean? Well, in life, you can sow to the physical or to the spiritual. So let me give you some examples of both. Sowing to the physical would be like lust, adultery, gossip, things that are immediately pleasing, maybe pornography. You can have something now, it feels good, but it doesn't give you anything worth having in the future. It's not something you can take into heaven. It's not something that when you get to heaven, you're going to say, look at how much of this I have. Um, earthly success. Is it good to work hard? Yeah, it's good. Is it good to be successful? Yeah, sure. But there is a limit to that. And if you make your whole life about money or about getting money, that's sowing to the physical, which only reaps physical rewards. 
Uh, maybe another physical uh, sewing that we could mention would be revenge. And so, okay, if those are physical sewings, how can we sew to the spiritual? How can we sew spiritually? Well, some examples I could come up, I could give you would be things that benefit others. If we look, for instance, back at Galatians 6.10, it said this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. So, uh, sowing spiritually could be benefiting others. And now we start to see what is what it means by good. How is what what is what what is the valuable action that, that Galatians 6 9 called good? Let us not grow weary in doing good. Well this verse st kind of starts to to unpeel that onion and kind of show us what makes something valuable? Whether it is whether it is impacting eternity or whether it's impacting me. Is it me focused or is it God focused? Is the motivation for me and my happiness, or is the motivation for God? See, you can do something really stupid with really good intentions, and it's a lot better than doing something really smart with really bad intentions. If you don't believe me, uh, you know, read books like Dune. <laughs> uh, look back on human history. And so what are some other things that we can sow to spiritually? Well, things that impact eternity and things we see in eternity. For instance, serving in ministry. That's something that we're going to see in eternity. It's going to impact eternity. When we witness to other people, that's going to impact eternity. It's going to change who we see there. There was a song uh, that was real popular years ago, probably in the, in the 90s, about basically it said, thank you for giving to the Lord. And it was talking about all these different people that the the singer saw in heaven. It was, obviously, they didn't really see it. Just It's just a story um, that he had had, uh, that he impacted in some way of them getting saved. And so that would be something that impacts eternity, something that we see in eternity. And a lot of times in ministry, you get real discouraged and real, real downtrodden because you don't see payback for all your hard work. But the thing is, there, there, there is, just not necessarily here. You might not get paid here, but that doesn't mean that it's pointless. And so when you're giving to the Lord, you have to remember that you're doing it for an eternal reward, not for immediately immediate happiness. So sometimes you give and it hurts and you keep giving because it's for God. Um, another example of how you can sow spiritually is carrying someone else's burdens. Look at verse 2 again. Carry one another's burdens in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So sowing spiritually could be carrying someone's burdens. So then that, bring, that, that brings up the question, well what about when you are older and there just isn't enough time left? You know, I'm just running out of time. I'm older now. Maybe when you have disease and maybe maybe you're going to die or or you don't have the strength or ability that you used to. I used to be able to, the, the furthest I biked, I, I biked it in over six hours, was 103 miles in a day. I biked 100 miles in a day. I don't remember exactly the time. It, it could have been five hours, could have been seven hours. It was somewhere around six hours, I think. Uh, but either way, I had biked 103 miles. That's the most I've ever done. And now I'm lucky if I can go an hour, which is basically 15 miles. Well, what if you do those good Christian things that you're supposed to, but you don't just don't see the wages from the work? It's very easy to come to the conclusion, well, my best years are behind me. And a lot like Margaret, you might get to that conclusion of, I just can't change. See, I told you that story was going to come back up. <laughs> And so you're left with these questions of how. How? How can this, there possibly be anything more? How can there possibly be better days ahead? And I think that the answer is found in Matthew chapter 13. It says, On that day Jesus went out to the house and was sitting by the sea. Such, a large, such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables. A parable is basically like a story that teaches a lesson. Like maybe um, if you remember uh, the fables, you know, with like the lion with a thorn in his paw, or maybe like the story of the uh, gingerbread man that went across the water on the fox's nose, something like that. that that's kind of like a parable, okay? So it has like a point to it, okay? So he told them many things in parables saying, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell among the path, and the birds came and devoured them. 
other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit. Some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. So did you catch that? Did, 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 did you see what he just said? The, the answer to our dilemma was right there. Right there. What about when you are older and there isn't enough time left? When you have disease and you don't have the strength and ability that you used to? What if you do those good cushion things but you don't see the wages on the work? Right here. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit. Some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. So we are scattering, we are sowing. We are scattering seed. And we don't know which ones are going to grow. So we're scattering all the seeds. <laughs> we're scattering everywhere that we can and all the opportunities that we can. And this is something I want you to get from this. That God is able to produce a hundred times the result that you put in. God can produce more than you put in. So maybe you only have two years left. Who knows? What, what's going to be the payback for that? What's going to be the, the, what's going to grow from that seed that's planted? God knows. But don't give up just because, hey, I just don't have that much longer left. I'm, I'm old, I'm worn out, there's nothing else. I, I don't know what's going to happen with your future, with your life, with your ministry. I don't know. But I do know that God can produce a hundredfold from what you put in. You don't know which seeds are going to take you don't know which ones are going to produce. You don't know which ones won't. What we do is we plant a seed and we get discouraged that it didn't bring something. First off, it might still bring something later. Second off, maybe it did and you're just not aware of it. Third off, that doesn't mean that all your seeds won't grow. That just means that one didn't. So for that reason, don't give up. Don't grow, don't grow weary of doing, doing good. Keep building and sowing spiritually. Keep pouring into other people's life. Keep encouraging people. Keep telling people about the gospel. Keep, you know, sacrificing yourself for the good of the church. Keep doing those things. Those are good things to do, and keep doing them. Keep doing that. Absolutely. And don't get discouraged when every when not every single one takes off. So I do want to add a, add a note because too many times I hear people talk about this and people walk away more discouraged than when they came. And the idea is something like this. Basically, I can never take a break. I have to keep working myself raw. I have to work myself to death. I have to do ministry and ministry and ministry, then work and then ministry, then work and then ministry. And uh, I'm just so tired of it all. Here's the thing. Take it easy, okay? <laughs> this does not mean don't take breaks. It doesn't mean don't revert to self. Uh, uh, it, what it does mean is that you can't revert to self-serving. Your life isn't about you. That's what, that's what I'm saying. But Galatians 6, and where it says don't grow weary of doing good, that doesn't mean that you, you can't take breaks, that you can't you know, have off days or have discouraged days. That's fine. It's saying don't give up. Let me give you some concrete examples. If you're a pastor, you keep serving people. You run into a huge hiccup. You have a church split. You don't know where to go. So maybe instead of giving up on ministry, maybe take a vacation. Maybe just take a couple days. Go up to the mountains or something. And just kind of calm yourself down. Get focused again. That kind of stuff. And that's a lot different than giving up. So how does this apply to me? We're talking about sowing and, 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 and reaping and all. How does any of that have anything to do with you? Well, first off, never give up. Never give up. There was this point in World War II that, um, it's not in my notes, it's something that I thought about when I was preaching this, and uh, I just wanted to mention that again on this live recording. Um, or I should say on this recording, it's not a live recording. There was this time in World War II when it was pretty much Britain was alone, and across the pond was was this massive, you know, Nazi German German army, and uh, America wasn't in the war yet, so it was pretty much all down to Britain, and uh, uh, and it was not looking good. But they held the line and they didn't give up, and because of their uh, uh, tenacity, their courage, their hope, uh, it, it Hitler didn't win. 
But it was a time when they were very vulnerable and it was very hard, but they never gave up. See, it doesn't matter if you feel useless. It, it doesn't matter. Never give up. You were created with purpose. And, and I said that on purpose. I, I didn't say that you were created for a purpose. I said you were created with purpose. The difference is this. If you were created for a purpose, that means there's one thing that you're supposed to do in life. If you miss it, you, your whole there, there's no point in you existing. It, it, you're beyond reconciliation. God can't use you. You're a waste of space. If you were created with purpose, that means you have value just being alive. Just by breathing, you have value. You don't earn your value. You don't prove your worth. You have purpose just because God made you. He formed you in your mother's womb. He made you special. So seek God and do what you can with what you have because you have value. So maybe not everybody can go. That's okay. Not everybody can give. You find what you can do and you do something with what you have. Well, I'm housebound and I'm poor and I don't have... So pray. And never give up. You keep seeking, you keep seeking, you keep seeking. The same thing I want to say, the same way this applies to you is no matter how old or sick or distraught you are, you can do something. Everybody can do something. Prayer. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, whatever, prayer. But prayer is one of the greatest activities that a Christian can be involved in to have the biggest in, in, impact on their communities. It's not the only thing that they should do. Yes, absolutely, we should pray and do, absolutely. But especially for those who are housebound, there's no shame in having a strong prayer life. No shame in that at all. I know many people whose lives were changed by a mighty move from God because there was a little old lady praying. Story after story. And I know the difference that it makes. My own family has experienced it. Maybe another way you can you can do something is pour into someone else. Maybe you can't do it yourself. Okay, pour into someone else. Well, I just I, I heard this the other, the other day. I was I was talking to somebody. I said something similar, and they said, "Well, I, I just I'm not strong enough. Like I just don't have enough good days. I'm in pain all the time. So write a letter on your good days, and then send it on your bad days, and you can improve you can you can improve somebody else's life. You can pour into someone else." even though you're housebound and sick and, and sore and hurting. Another thing you can do is join with others. The, the, the dream of the church is, is a wonderful dream. And it's a dream worth pursuing. And it's something that, yeah, we can do. That's something we can do. We can be encouraged with one another. We can encourage one another. We can go out and serve. We can witness. We can, there's so much we can do together. Some can go, some can give, but everyone can do something. You can do something. Now, Next lesson, what we're going to look at, is how can there be better days when something irreversible has happened? Okay, what, 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 when something unfair and unchangeable has happened, how can there possibly be better days? Lord, I pray that you'd use us more, and I pray that we'd have an impact on our cities. I pray that we would point people to you, and that you'd be glorified through it. We love you, Lord. Amen.